But man, yeah, it's just been a great uplifting day too. Um, it, it really is got my uh, energy flowing and kind of a letdown now that I have to speak after all that. There's not any possible way that I can outdo what we've already done, not as if it's some contest anyway, but um, hopefully you can endure me for a short time as we study what I've got listed on the screen here, but the high places were not removed. That's a quote from really several places in scripture about the kings of Judah. And I intended to speak on that, um, but we're really not going to quite get there in this part one. It's going to be a two-parter. And the reason why, um, I will not give further explanation, the reason why is you can blame chance. That's all I'll say. And uh, that's between me and him. But I'm going to give a part, I got half of this lesson up and I'm going to give part one this afternoon. So it'll be a little shorter than my part two. And hopefully by the end of it, we'll have an answer to what, how, like Josh said, how some of these kings of Judah were described as faithful. They did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, it says. Sometimes it says in all their ways, but, or nevertheless, they did not remove the high places. Or the people continued to offer sacrifices on the high places. And so, um, if you've ever been reading through your Old Testament and you come across those statements, it can be very perplexing. If you're like me, man, it's like, how does this work? In one sentence, the Bible is saying that they were faithful, they did what was right in the Lord, and then in the next sentence it says, but they did not remove the high places, and idolatry being as big of an issue as it was for the nation and in the eyes of God, it seems like that's a major contradiction. Well, I would encourage you up front to read very carefully. Read very carefully, and also read with the right uh, mindset, looking for what the Holy Spirit was intending us for, to understand from the books of Kings and Chronicles. Those are two reading tips, and I think if we do that, we'll have a better understanding of what the Bible is trying to get to us. Now, if, you, if you've been reading through your Bible this year, you've read through Kings and Chronicles, and you've covered all the stuff that we've taught up to this point. What we've covered to this point in our Old Testament histories are all these biblical periods up to the divided kingdom period. And this is where we're at now. You'll recall, I think Trevor, maybe, or Nathan, covered the split of the nation that occurred whenever Rehoboam took the throne. And from that point forward, it was known as the divided kingdom, ten tribes in the north and two in the south, with Levites scattered about. Um, and so it, we've been doing this for two years. I don't know if y'all realize that. And we, Lord willing, will finish that history of the Old Testament at the end of 2023. So we're on pace. Uh, stay with us. And I've been really impressed with our teachers in carrying us through this. And if there's any fault to be had, it's probably on me because I'm the one writing the assignments. And, uh, and so you can blame me for any lacks in the whole teaching schedule. Um, these are all the passages that we're going to cover tonight. And there's some lengthier readings in there. I'm going to go off from my beaten path, and I'm going to preach primarily from the PowerPoint tonight, and I'm going to have all the scriptures up on the screen. I don't usually do that, but I'm going to do that tonight. <laughs> because, again, chance. Um, so, I'm going to blame him for everything, whether it's true or not. Now, this is what I want to cover tonight. Um, we're really only going to get through this first section, and that's the goal number one, is to talk about uh, the difficulties that come up whenever you're reading about the kings of Judah. Now, there's two major difficulties. I've spoken of one of them already. Uh, the other one is what we're going to cover this afternoon. Uh, in our further study, we're going to find out some explanations, some reasonable explanations, I think, for some of these difficulties and how you make sense of them. And then finally, in applying this, we want to understand what this teaches us about the nature of restoration. And that's something... Restoration is something that applies to every generation, and that's the idea of restoring God's will, no matter what covenant we live under. In this case, it's the new covenant, but in their time, they were trying to restore the people to the law of Moses and to the Mosaic covenant. So we're going to see what that has to do at the end of all this in terms of us restoring the kingdom of God in our day. But let's get back to this goal number one, and that's bringing to light some of the difficulties that come about. And the first one we want to talk about is the fact that kings of Judah are described as good and evil almost within the same breath. And this is closely related to the next difficulty, which has to do with the high places that we opened up about. And so we want to talk about how some of these kings are described as good 
and yet evil at the same time make sense of that. Um, these are all the kings of Judah. Again, these are this is the southern kingdom. And there's 20 names up there. I don't know if you can see all those, but 20 names. And I have highlighted eight names. I believe that's eight. Yes, that's eight names. And those eight names that I have highlighted in blue are the good kings of Judah. And so if you're reading through your Old Testament, you'll read in the book of Kings all of these names. One of, some of them will have two names. And so when you're reading in the book of Chronicles, you'll come across what seems like a new king. Pay attention and make sure that it's not the same king with a different name. For example, Uzziah is called Uzziah in Chronicles, but he's called Azariah in the book of Kings. So there's 20 kings. Eight of them are described as good at some point in their life. But out of those eight kings that are described as good, only five of them are actually good throughout their whole life. And when I say that, they're good throughout their whole life, um, that doesn't mean that they didn't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they didn't make big mistakes. Out of those eight that were good throughout their whole life, only Jotham and Josiah have very, very, very little bad to say about them. The rest of them uh, seem to have some major problems, even though they were still described as doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, following the footsteps of their father David, or their father that came before them that was good. And so, um, out of all those, Jotham and Hezekiah were really good kings. And Hezekiah and Josiah um, were especially, to take note of, those were also especially good kings. Even though Hezekiah had some hiccups, Hezekiah and Josiah were the only ones that the, I can find that the Bible says they destroyed the high places. And the rest of these good kings were good kings, but there's always that caveat but they did not destroy the high places. And Hezekiah and Josiah receive a lot of attention in the book of Chronicles because they were restorers of the temple in a time where the temple was left in shambles and because they also went the extra mile and destroyed the high places. Now, again, I think there's reasonable explanations for why these other kings didn't and accounting for that, but we'll get to that in part two. Now, um, I want to go through a couple of these. King Jehoshaphat and King Asa particularly are described they're two great examples of kings that were good kings but they were also bad kings <laughs> and so we'll use them as case studies this afternoon in trying to get to the bottom of this and i'd like to look at second chronicles chapter 20 to give us an idea of what i'm talking about here so read along with me i'm reading from the new king james version here and the bible says if you can read that and if you can't turn in your bibles maybe second chronicles 20 verse 31 says so jehoshaphat was king over judah he was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai, and he walked in the ways of his father Asa, and he did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. He did not depart from the ways of his father Asa, but he did depart from the ways of his father Asa. That's what we're about to find out. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, indeed they're written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, which is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish, and they made the ships to ezion Geber. But Eliezer, the son of Dodova of Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked, so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Now, when I said that he actually did not follow the Lord in all his ways, I wasn't saying that the Bible was lying. Don't mistake me there. I'm saying that it seems like, um, from the first statement that that can't be true. I'll tell you this up front. Whenever the Bible says that this man did with all that was right in the eyes of the Lord, he did not depart from it. I believe this is either an idiom or some type of a hyperbole to describe the total compass of this man's life. I'm not taking any one screenshot from his life and making, um, making a case out of it from one screenshot in his life. Does that make sense? Any one of our lives, you can look at the best people that you've ever known, and you could somebody could see that person on any given day of the week and might see them sin. 
Might even see them do something horrific. And from that's all they know about that person. And from that one screenshot in that person's life, your neighbor thinks this is a terrible person. Or they're a sinner. I can't believe that they're a leader even, maybe at the church down there at Chapel Grove. But when you look at the full compass of this man's life, that's the description that's given of King Asa, even the, or King Jehoshaphat, sorry. Even though there's a screenshot right here of where he allied himself with one of the most wicked kings in Israel's history. Ahaziah that he allied himself with was a grandson, I believe it was, of King Ahab, of which the Bible says there was no one like King Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness. And that was his grandson, Ahaziah. Well, Jehoshaphat allied himself with Ahab, and he allied himself with Ahaziah. So obviously he has some weaknesses, but when we take the full compass of his life, we can trust the word of God when it says that he walked in the ways of his father Asa and he did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. More than all that, I think there's a good reason why the Bible um, includes the details that it does on these men and leaves out other details. We'll explain that in just a minute. Let's look at another case study, and that's King Asa. King Asa, more so, it seems to me, was a great example of somebody who was a good king, but he had some major flaws. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles 16 first. It says there in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 10, Then Asa was angry with the seer, the prophet, and he put the prophet in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the books of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. If you just read this description of him toward the end of his life in the book of Kings, you would get the impression that Asa was not a very good man. Somebody that a prophet from God spoke the word of God, and he said, Be quiet. And then he oppressed the people of Israel. That's the same language that's used to Pharaoh whenever Pharaoh oppressed God's people. You have a king of Israel, or Judah, oppressing God's people like Pharaoh a thousand years before, and somehow this guy's a good king? And that's hard to swallow. If we read another account in 1 Kings, it says this in chapter 15. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. And he here's proof of it right here. He banished the perverted persons from the land. He removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He removed Maacah, his grandmother, from being queen mother, because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it in the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. He also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. To read this account, Asa's totally, totally different picture. This guy's a great guy. He did all these wonderful things. This one doesn't even mention the fact that he was diseased in his feet. The implication seems there to be that this was actually brought on by God, this disease in his feet. The one on the left side of your screen that happened to him. And so God cursed him. It doesn't tell us, if you'll pay attention, it does not really tell us what happened on his deathbed. It doesn't tell us what happened in his last days. It's giving us a screenshot that toward the end of his life, at the very least, he had a weakness. And he trusted the physicians more than he trusted God's word. Now, I'll also put this forth to you. I don't know what kind of disease he had in his feet. People can hypothesize. Um, you see, I see people a lot, of course, in the hospital who have diseases of the feet and different illnesses. And I think to myself, it would be miserable to be in their state. Um, I'm, we have members of the congregation here. It would be miserable to be in their health state. And I'm sure if you ask those people every single day, do they wake up with a smile and give glory to God? Now, that might be what they should do, obviously. When I say might, it should be what they do. But if you ask those people, is it easy to do that? And do you do that every day? They probably don't. And some of that you, you can wear on you. And it, it would seem to me, if I'm trying to make sense of all this, that that's probably what happened to King Asa. 
And it would be very easy to start trusting more in physicians than in the word of God. Not to justify his actions. What I am saying is here's a possible explanation of why he lost faith in God for a moment. And we don't really have the details of what happened at the end. And I think that's actually pertinent that we don't have an explanation of did Asa die saved or did he die lost? Sometimes we get caught up in what the Bible doesn't say. Now, I think there is significance when the Bible is silent about something. But when it comes to like these narratives is what I'm talking about and these stories, sometimes we get caught up in the details that aren't even mentioned. And we spend all, and I say this about myself. So in reading the Bible uh, several times, I've always come across these stories in the Kings and Chronicles and I always <clears throat> seem to find myself wanting to know, was Asa saved? And it just eats at my mind. And I don't know if everybody's like that. Maybe that uh, goes back to type A, type B personalities. And maybe some of y'all are like, I, don't, I really don't care. But it really bothers me because I really want to know. But obviously, God was not concerned that I know. And if God wasn't concerned that I know, it must mean that I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm looking for the wrong message. God didn't, he wasn't writing this to tell us whether Asa was saved or not. He's writing things about Asa to teach us. And here's what I believe it teaches us. These are snapshots, I said screenshots earlier, which tell the nation of Israel about covenant faithfulness and covenant unfaithfulness to God. Now, I believe there's a good case. We're going to focus on the book of Chronicles to prove this. In Chronicles, if you pay attention to the book of Chronicles, um, toward the end of the book, there's a decree by King Cyrus made. Now, King Cyrus was the king of Medo-Persia, that conquered the nation of Babylon. And Babylon is the nation that uh, Etienne this morning read about that captured Israel, destroyed the temple, and took Daniel into captivity. So whoever wrote the book of Chronicles, it was after the captivity. And the people of Israel were probably in captivity at that point, And they're writing to a nation of people, most of whom are in Persia at the least, and they're wondering, is God, has he abandoned his people? Why has this happened? And they're questioning. And, and then they also want to know, how do we restore the kingdom? How do we get back to where we were? And I believe all of these stories, especially in the book of Chronicles, are teaching us some element of what covenant faithfulness is like. Because to get back to where we were, to have the kingdom restored like it was, we have to get back to covenant faithfulness. And what that looks like, you can see in the lives of these kings. You can see in the lives of these kings. And for a people that they were not a perfect people and they had sins, this should give us hope if we're an Israelite that even though we're not perfect, there's still hope. And we can get back to doing what is right in the Lord's eyes. And on our epitaph, it can still say, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord all his days. That can be the life summary. That can be the life summary of anybody. And that's just a way of application as well while we're on it. If you are somebody that thinks that you have done so much that the Lord can never forgive you, any one of these kings, well, at least the ones that are described as falling after David, any one of these kings can uh, be a ray of hope to you. However, there is a condition, and it's covenant faithfulness. Now, I want to talk about covenant faithfulness for just a minute, what I mean by that. It may be a phrase that we don't use. It may be a big phrase, especially if you're in high school. Uh, that's something, a phrase I probably didn't hear until well after high school. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, to make a case and give evidence for what I'm talking about, why the book of Chronicles was written, uh, let's read this section from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 23 through 28. And this is from the reign of King Josiah. Josiah was the last good king of Israel or Judah. And there were four kings after him in quick succession that would lead to the fall of to Babylon. But in this circumstance, Josiah is restoring the temple. He has sent the prophet Hilkiah, who has brought to his attention the word of the Lord that was written and had dust on it in the temple. He sends Hilkiah back to the Lord to inquire of the Lord. And this is what it says. Then she answered them. This is actually Huldah, the prophetess. Then she answered him, uh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book, which we have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Now before reading the second half of this passage, I want you to notice he brings attention, or she, this prophetess brings attention to the curses that are written in the book. That's referring to the curses of the covenant that were written in the book of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. Now, somebody, I, I don't remember who covered that in our study um, of the Old Testament when we came across that. But in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, there's a whole list of curses for, keep, for not keeping the covenant. And there's a longer list, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a list of blessings for keeping the covenant. And there's a longer list of curses for not keeping the covenant. And if you look at the curses for not keeping the covenant... And you actually go to the book of Jeremiah, who is prophesying during the captivity of Babylon. You'll see that he uses some of the exact same language that Moses said would happen if they were unfaithful to the covenant. Josiah is restoring the land. He's returning the people to faithfulness to God. And, he, and this prophetess is saying that if you continue down this way of idolatry and wickedness, you will receive the curses of the covenant. And it happened. But if you return, then you'll receive the blessings of the covenant, is what the implication is. And so, it goes on to say, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace." And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they brought back word to the king. What's the condition for not receiving the curses of the covenant and being restored? It's humility. It's repentance. You can describe it as covenant faithfulness. And so whenever we see the screenshots of these kings' lives, how they followed the word of the Lord, um, that's relaying to us what covenant faithfulness looks like. And when we see them making alliances with Ahaziah and their ships being torn to pieces because they did wickedly in that moment in their life, we see covenant unfaithfulness and the consequences of it. And if the people of Israel will get back to being faithful to God, then they will receive the blessings of God and the kingdom will be restored like it was in the days of David. Well, I want to talk about one other passage real quick before we're done. Uh, a couple of passages really. In 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 14, the Bible says this. I think we already read this. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. That's a, uh, I guess you could call that an epitaph. Maybe that was on his tombstone. But the, his heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. And we know, we already brought attention to this, that Asa had a great moment of weakness in his old age. But that's what's written about him. That's in contrast to King Amaziah. It says in 2 Chronicles 25, verse 2, Amaziah did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Now that's a very good verse to highlight. I want you to look at those two descriptions of these two men and see the difference between them. They both did what was right. Sorry, this is annoying me. They both did what was right, but one of them did it with a loyal heart, and one of them did not do it with a loyal heart. That teaches us what covenant faithfulness is. Covenant faithfulness is not just going through the motions. It's not just, just doing what is right on an outward, external front. It's doing what's right with a loyal heart. You can have, and by that I don't mean with sincerity, that's included, but with a loyal heart, with a faithful heart. That would include sincerity, but it's describing more than just sincerity. Some people, and we'll get back to this in just a second, some people focus, like Amaziah, just on the letter of the law. But they don't do it with a loyal heart. And that will get you the curses of the covenant. Some people focus only on the spirit that you do something in to the exclusion of the law. 
Now, I'm not saying there's nobody on that screen that describes that, but there's some people that have that attitude. And that will get you the curses of the covenant. And so what you have to remember is somebody that does what's right with a loyal heart. And I think we see that in the life of Asa. When you take his whole life into view and what the scriptures relate to us, he was a man that obviously the Holy Spirit knew what he was talking about. He was a man that did what was right and had a loyal heart when he did it. That also should give us encouragement that though we may make mistakes, that mistake doesn't have to define us. And we can, at the end of our life, have made mistakes and still be faithful to God and have tr followed him with a loyal heart. This is concept is described further in Hosea chapter 6. This is a much later. Actually, Hosea lives and prophesies during the days of Isaiah, during the days of Hezekiah. And Hosea is speaking to the northern tribes of Israel, and he describes their hearts like this. He says, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim, one of the tribes of the northern kingdom? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. You can't depend on them. Their loyalty is undependable. Therefore, I've hewn them in places or in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. Because they're unfaithful, he has brought on them the curses of the covenant. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. When you don't, aren't faithful to the covenant in heart and action, then you receive the curses of the covenant. And he's saying to these people right here that I desire loyalty rather than sacrifice. Now, this verse is a very key verse. It's quoted several times in the New Testament. It's very important to understand. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. I desire loyalty and not sacrifice. I'm going to show you a couple of other translations. This is the New King James Version. It says it like this in the New American Standard. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. When you read that verse uh, quoted in Matthew chapter 15, I believe it is, um, and Matthew chapter 12, uh, in your New King James translation, it translates uh, mercy instead of loyalty. It takes that Hebrew word and translates it mercy and not sacrifice. In the English Standard Version, it says, Therefore I desire steadfast love, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I want to explain this for just a minute. What does it mean that God desires love and not sacrifice? Does it mean that God really doesn't care if we offer him sacrifices? God really doesn't care if we do what he asks of us to do? I really just would prefer it if you showed love to me and love to each other. Or is he saying that I don't really care if you follow the letter of the law as long as you show mercy to one another. And that's the greater good. It's more important to be merciful than it is to be faithful to the law. Or is he saying, I desire loyalty. And that means, and is a, probably a better translation that encompasses the heart and the attitude and the action that God wants. Loyalty, faithfulness. Uh, the Hebrew word that's used here is the Hebrew word hesed. That's translated love and loyalty and faithfulness. Uh, here you go. Mercy. And it could be translated any one of these ways, but we have to understand not to choose the translation that fits our fancy and to get the concept that's actually being taught. And when Jesus quotes this passage in the New Testament, and when Hosea is speaking it, he's saying, God wants you to offer the sacrifice with a loyal heart. He doesn't want you to be like Amaziah and just offer the sacrifice and go through the motions. He wants you to offer the sacrifice. That's important. But he wants you to do it with a loyal heart. And he says it in this way to get the point across poetically as if I would rather you be faithfully, I would rather you be faithful and loyal than to offer me just a sacrifice. And that seems to be the idea. Now, these kings here, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah are five of those original eight kings that fit that description. And they were exceptions to the rule in the nation of Israel. And I'll, I'm going to put on here and embarrass a few people. <clears throat> in today's environment in the church at Chapel Grove, you could take any of these people. And I'm just throwing names out there. Of course, I'm not God. Um, 
I could have chosen lots of names, but if you were to take these names here and you were to read them in place of those kings in our day, uh, perhaps these are examples of people in our congregation who uh, fit this description of faithfulness and loyalty, and hopefully all of us fit this description. I wasn't trying to be biased by putting these names on here. I'm just trying to give you actual people to identify with in our congregation. If you uh, follow God faithfully like Asa and Jehoshaphat and Jotham and Hezekiah and Josiah, then that same epitaph can be written of you and this congregation will be blessed. It's not to say that we aren't going to go through hardship. It's not going to say that we're going to all be rich and we're going to have all of our problems taken away. And No, that's not the point. But the idea is that we will be blessed spiritually and God will smile upon us because we are his kingdom restored and we are restoring his kingdom. Um, I wanted to read this passage. Actually, FDN, I thought did a really good job this morning. He read a passage that really caught my attention. <clears throat> And I want to read it again. In James 5, 17, it said, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. I thought that passage was so powerful because he took one example of a person from the Old Testament, James does, and he says, this man, and, and I've always thought of Elijah as just like way up here. I think Elijah may be one of those people in the Bible that there's nothing ever bad said ever, anything about him. And you think of Elijah, and he prayed fervently, and God heard his prayers. And you think, well, yeah, because it was Elijah. <laughs> but the writer says, but he had a nature just like ours. And Elijah didn't have some special DNA that you don't have. Elijah was a man just like you and a woman just like you. And so when we look at any character in the Old Testament and you see the mistakes that Asa made and you criticize him because he trusted in the physicians and not in God, you know what? Asa had a nature just like you. And so, in what area of your life are you trusting in the physicians and not in the Lord? Josiah, a really good king, had a nature just like you and me. These men, are, there's details that are not shared about these men. Uh, but they were men just like you and me. If you'll pay attention in the book of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles gives an account of King David. In the account of King David in Chronicles, the Sin with Bathsheba is not mentioned. And there's one other major sin that he committed. Um, well, the killing of Uriah. That's all connected. There's another one that slips my mind. Those are not mentioned in the book of Chronicles. If you read the book of Chronicles about King David, he's an almost spotless man. Not so in the book of Kings. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is he described in this way? Well, I believe that just because that uh, a Bible character has nothing bad said about him. David's an example that that doesn't mean that he didn't ever do anything bad. You see? And so these men and these women had natures just like ours. And we need to understand that if we will look at their life and look at the nation in their time and take away the good and leave the bad, then we can be blessed as a people just like they were. And so that's what I want us to take away from this. I think that's what we should be looking for in the book of Chronicles and Kingdom when we're reading through them. And so when you're reading through, look for their uh, details that are given to their faithfulness to the word of the Lord, their faithfulness to the law of God, and also take away the fact that uh, these men that were faithful, they were counted faithful because they did the right thing with the right heart. Not because they did the right thing, and not just because they had the right heart. They did the right thing with the right heart. And that's what we have to be like. That's what I'll leave you with this afternoon. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead. Do it. Like right now, click on it.